Okay. Um, as we looked at last week, uh, how Jesus was in Leviticus. Let's look at um, uh, how, as a Christians, we are to live today, like uh, how Christ lived on this earth. Uh, we know Christ has been the Lord and Savior, and we have seen there are so many um, designation or the names to call him. There are some people call him as a prophet, someone calls him a teacher, someone calls him a king of kings, lord of lords. There are many, many names has been given to Jesus as his, in a title. I don't know uh, how you look at uh, uh, the name of Jesus and what's a title comes to you. But the Bible gives one title which uh, many of us don't uh, know or we don't recognize it which you will find in uh, Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 20. It talks about Jesus. It says, Where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So here the title what is given to Jesus is forerunner. Forerunner is someone who could uh, run ahead of us so that we can run behind him. That's someone who has gone ahead of us. That's what the meaning of him. So when it comes to Jesus, if we don't see him, that how he came and he lived as a man and lived under the the Holy Spirit, live anointed by the Holy Spirit, living under the guidance of God as a son of God, son of man on the on this earth, we will not be able to follow him. Jesus never called us to say, Come admire me. Come look and see how I am doing it. Come to my crusade or come to my uh, teaching and see how I am doing. No, 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 no. He said in John chapter 1 when he the disciples came and asked him okay where teacher where are you staying where are you living he said come and see so this is Jesus is um, the one of the words what he frequently used is follow me you don't find this word in the Old Testament following me uh, there is nobody can say in the Old Covenant under the Old Testament uh, you see the great man of Elijah uh, who brought fire from heaven, who slaughtered uh, so many false prophets uh, with a single-handedly and brought some mighty miracles. Yet, what happened? When a time comes, he got depressed. And he doesn't know. He says, Lord, I don't want to live. I want to die. You see, the pattern in the Old Covenant, there is nobody could say, follow me. Uh, what I find uh, over the period in my life, I have seen uh, even in my own uh, personal life, I used to preach um, saying that don't look at me, look at Christ. I thought it is very spiritual. I used to say that many times in my earlier in the beginning. But I found that I've been a hypocrite in saying that. If I can't follow, how can I teach someone to follow? If I can't keep up certain commandments, if I can't keep up something, how could I teach somebody do this way when I myself cannot do it? You see the flaw in it? So in the New Testament, it is, you have to see how I live and you have to follow. That's why Apostle Paul was able to say that come and follow me. And one of the reasons why in my own life also it has happened is I had a chance to spend some time with Brother Agastin Chavakumar about a few years back. About 10 or 11 days I was there. I asked numerous questions and I looked at his life, how he is living, how he is handling. I was so, so encouraged there is someone who could live like that exactly what the Bible says, how as a Christian, how the word of God says, somebody can live. You know, because we find it, there are some commandments, oh, it is very difficult. 
you know, we, 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 we do say certain commandments, we say, oh, it's very difficult. You know, Satan has deceived us that way. If we can't do it, then God would have asked us to do it. So the Satan, what he has tricked us is that you can't do it. But when we come to God, that God, I can't do it. I need your grace. I, I can't do whatever you have asked me to do, but I need your help so that I can live. Then God would help us so we will be able to overcome. But as long as we are going to see like, you know, now look at Jesus and then we say, okay, very good. You know, I can't do like, um, you know, what Jesus did. No, Jesus never said you go and do like this. He said you will do greater things. But what he said is you follow me. How did he live his life? That's what is our primary focus that he is a forerunner. The one of the problem immediately people think, oh, Jesus was God, he can, but I can't. That's a, immediately people come across, they say, no, 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 Jesus can, brother, because Jesus was son of God, so he was able to. It is not, you know, in same Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, it says, in as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood that he himself that is jesus himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of the death that is the devil he made like us in same chapter uh, hebrews chapter 2 verse 17 it says therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren in how many things in all things every way that jesus was made like us uh, just for a moment turn to keep a finger here come to philippians chapter 2 Verse uh, 5, 6, 7, let me read this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it a robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, take, taking the form of bond servant and coming in the likeness of a man, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So Jesus was made like you and me. We need to get this very, very clear. If we don't understand that, you know, Jesus was made like you and me, then we will not even attempt to live like him. Jesus was made like exactly you and me. But he was without sin. He knew no sin. If we don't see Jesus was made like us and he lived like us, then we, what we become is, we become Antichrist. Uh, 1 John. 1 John talks about Antichrist uh, very much in first John chapter 4 chapter 4 verse 1 it says beloved do not believe every spirit but test the spirits whether they are of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world and then he says by this you know the spirit of God okay Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ ha has come in the flesh is of God. You check every spirit which confesses that Jesus Christ came in the flesh and he was made like a man and he suffered as a man, he died as a man and he manifested in, uh, in the human form 
if that is then that spirit is from god and what is not from god the next verse and every spirit that does not confess that jesus christ has come in the flesh is not of god and this is the spirit of the antichrist which you have heard was coming and it is now already in the world so if you don't agree or you don't confess that jesus christ has not come in the flesh then you are received a christ antichrist see the antichrist means it's nothing um, uh, you don't have to uh, make a big theology out of it anything is agreeing with christ is the spirit of christ anything against the spirit of christ is antichrist that's what antichrist is so the antichrist or the antichrist whatever way you call it is the one who not does not confess that jesus came in the flesh but he was god and he didn't come as a man that's a spirit of antichrist there are well meaning people who um, hold the uh, god and who Uh, do certain things but still they don't believe there are many people uh, even from some pulpits or some churches they don't say that you can overcome the sin they think it is impossible it is impossible the moment you feed your mind thinking that it is impossible you are already been defeated you are already defeated if satan get defeat you in your mind that you can't live according to god's holy standards then you are not going to try it you are not even going to try it. what will happen you will start justifying your anger you will just start justifying your frustration you will start justifying your depression you will start justifying your unforgiveness you will start saying that they did this that's why this has happened it is not me you know the, my wife did that my brother in law did that my mother in law did that my sister in law did that or some law did it so you will try to put the onus on the someone else and then you will say i am right because you are not you are not going to become like christ because you don't even attempt to become like christ because you don't you have not confessed that christ has come in the flesh and he has defeated every spirit it's seen in um, chapter 2 verse 8 in hebrews chapter 2 verse 18 for in that he himself has suffered being tempted he is able to aid those who are tempted he is being tempted jesus is being tempted yet he was without sin so that he can aid those who are being tempted so what happened is Jesus came he lived in the flesh and he was tempted and every temptation he overcame by the word of god every word what is ever spoken he took it from word of god that's how he overcame by the word of the testimony as revelation says you can overcome by the word of the testimony that's a word of god so he was able to overcome when he was tested or when he was tempted so how do you uh, go through when there is a temptation or when there is a test how do you go through it i find there are many people who still fail in the same subject year after year so they live a defeated christian life throughout their lifetime in a normal school we send our children if they go to year 5 they they have to end of the year they are being tested there is a test there is a examination so they have to go write their exams when they pass their exam they go to the next year but in a christian life you get the same question paper year after year you fail how do you think you will get passed you get the same question paper about anger for example i take anger you get the same question paper every time you say okay lord i want to love you and i want to serve you jesus i love you jesus i surrender you come and worship 
and then next day or the same day you are being tested what happened again you fail and then again okay you come back you make a commitment again you tell god what happened same problem so throughout their life they have been defeated people have been defeated by anger people have been defeated by porn- pornography people have been defeated by so many uh, secret sexual sins and so many things you go you you have been defeated time and again because you don't seek how jesus overcame and how you could overcome the this verse says he will aid us he will help us Uh, look at in hebrews chapter 4 verse 14 seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens jesus the son of god let us hold fast our confession verse 15 for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin Jesus was tempted like you and me in every way. Every way he was tested yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. So when we are being tempted, when you are being tested, when you are go through that, you should be able to find grace and mercy so that we can also overcome so we need to seek out to him because he can understand the difficulty or the trial what you are going to go through or whatever the problem you are going through he knows them all so that you can understand how this has happened and you will be able to overcome with the help from him because he has already passed through the forerunner is the one who has already gone like you pass through uh, certain exams like uh, the very well known ca chartered accountant exam you have to go through inter and then you have to pass so when the guys they are going to go through the exam the guy who has passed he will come and teach the other guy so that he becomes very well well versed with the subject so they teach okay this is how the question will come this is how you have to do it or maybe you are going to a new place where you have not gone you have not gone to a new country or you are going to a new place like here we are many people want to go to lake district in uk so someone wants to go to lake district you have already been to lake district what do you say hey you go this is the lake you have to go this is the place you can stay hey, you do the boating this will be nice or as we all live in london we know when somebody comes from anywhere they want to do a sightseeing so by heart you can say okay get down at this tube station take a left turn three steps four steps this one that one we all very familiar with that why because we have been there we know exactly that is what jesus will do to you jesus will teach you how to go what to do what not to do you know one of the very comforting verse you will find in first corinthians chapter 10 first corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 no temptation has overtaken you except just such as is common to man but god is faithful remember that god is faithful irrespective of what you have done or where you are in your life god is faithful god is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it there are two things one is you will not be tested in the lesson what god has already taught you god will prepare you and he will test you in the known area only what has been taught 
I, when I was growing up, uh, we used to uh, write the state board exams uh, to go to the university and things like that. So we used to go, you have to go and appear the state board exam and you have to write the question. Sometimes what happens is there will be a question called out of portion question will come. So if you have attempt to write the, if you have written the question number or you wrote something, if it's out of portion, everyone gets full mark for that question. I don't know how many of you know this. It's, it's used to be that way. So out of portion question, you get full marks. Same way, even in God's thing, He will test you what you cannot bear. He will not test you. He will know exactly whether you will be able to bear it or not. He must have taught you already. He must have told you how to be humble. Then He will check whether you have got pride in you. He will, he will teach you how to keep your body as the temple of the Holy Spirit. Then you will be tested with the pornography. And he will teach you how to love a person. Then he will test you with whether you are angry. You, God will test you with a stumbling block when you have gotten any unforgiveness with somebody. Every time you are being tested, God would have run the lesson for you. God would have prepared you. And in the midst of it also, he will make a way for you so that you can escape through that. It's not a, you know... Uh, system that you you will fail it's a wonderful way god runs a test you know he gives you the question he gives you the answer and then he asks you to choose that's a wonderful god but the only thing is unfortunately what we do is we tend to take it on ourselves and then we try to make a mickey out of it that's why we we fail many times if only we are able to listen to god what God has to say and what God is trying to do in your life and you, if you have the patience to listen then you will be able to bear the temptation not only you will be able to bear it and also you will be able to escape through that if that's what it's here it says so how did Jesus escape the temptation let's look at that come to Matthew chapter 4 Matthew 4, you, you know this, uh, Jesus has been uh, filled with the Holy Spirit and he goes through this uh, wilderness and that is tempted by devil. Uh, Matthew 4 verse 1, it says, Then Jesus was uh, led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had f fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Okay? The first temptation, what he is saying, If you are the Son of God. Okay? Just for a moment, you look, um, you know, just before this, when Jesus, uh, in Matthew chapter 3, before he... Um, goes into the wilderness the Matthew 3 verse 17 and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased so Jesus is going to take baptism he goes down the water and he comes up and the Holy Spirit comes upon him descend upon him like a dove and there is a sound coming from heaven what is the sound says this is my beloved son I am in whom I am well pleased. Notice that he is not saying he is my son. He is my beloved son. My, uh, my love. This is my love. My son. My loving beloved. You know I love him so much. Uh, he pleases me so much. That's a kind of an, a language. Beloved son. You know there are son, disobedient son, rebellious son. Uh, okay son and a beloved son he is comes under the category he is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased whether he is pleased or not I am well pleased so that means God is so pleased and God is very happy to call he is my beloved son what does the tempter comes and ask him if you are the son of God you see first God runs a question paper he runs the answer 
and then the test comes so if you are the son of god okay i know just now god told me i am the beloved son 40 days before when i went to the water i heard the voice saying that i am the beloved son i am the i am still the beloved son i know who i am i don't have to prove it to you who i am i know who i am you see that thing very clearly and then the other part is he gives an escape route say one is he runs you and he tests you what you know and the second is the escape route you see the jesus answer but he answered and said it is written man shall not live by bread alone but every word that proceeds from the mouth of god so he is quoting the scriptures that's why i tell you my dear brothers and sisters it's very important that we store ourselves with the word of god you know that's a only weapon god has given us if you look at in ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 onwards you see the armor of god in the whole armor of god everything is given is to protect you there's only one armor is given the sword it is none other than the word of god so that's the only weapon we have rest everything is to defend you one we can attack the enemy one we can attack which is the word of god that is why jesus quotes from deuteronomy chapter 6 he says man shall not live by bread alone but every word that proceeds out of the mouth so the first temptation first part he took it because he has already know the answer he is the beloved son which he has heard he was tested so he was firmly secured on that and the second part here is the escape route he says okay i am not going to tempt her to do something because it is written that man shall not live by bread alone but every word that comes from the mouth of god then he says then the devil took him up into the holy city and let him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him if you are the son of god again you see if you are the son of god it's not you know the, the enemy is not going to rest you the ship are been built to go inside the storm the ships are been you know it if the ship has been built it has been kept on the store it may look nice but then it needs to be tested whether it will be able to withstand the storm it will be withstand the battering of the sea and the rain and the thunder and the lightning and everything i don't know how many of you know that there are uh, the airline companies they have got a special people and what they do is when there is a thunderstorm and there is a lightning they take the testing aircraft they go inside the thunder they want to see how the aircraft uh, behaves what happens when you go through the thunder when you go through the hurricane so they always test the aircraft so that they can be better equipped when the passengers are there so they go and test it when there is a thing so the same way god uh, what god does is he sends you so that you can be well equipped a christian life is like a uh, emergency services when there is a trouble everybody run away from the trouble but a christian life is we run to trouble it's like an ambulance service it's like a fire service it's like a police it's like an uh, all the emergency crew they go run to the problem they don't run away from the problem that's what a christian life is because we know in that midst of it god will be there and god will deliver us so that we can be a blessing to somebody that's a escape route god will make it for us again he says if you are the son of god you you throw yourself then jesus answered for it is written he shall give us angels charge over you and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone now satan quotes couple of scriptures to jesus uh, this is why i tell you uh, it's so important there are a lot of people who can preach very good message there are a lot of people who can quote lot of scriptures but they you can only look at them from outside they are not to be followed you have to be very careful i'm telling you my dear brothers and sisters 
that's why a christian a christianity today we have got so many false doctrine there are so many false christians for bogus leaders it's only because they are all out there to collect your money collect certain things and then they can live a, um, a big life and run a big aircraft and all kinds of nonsense because they know the scriptures if you take for example uh, the one person who knows the scripture much better than any one of us is satan not only that james says he even trembles that doesn't make him a believer we got to realize that so here he quotes couple of scriptures it is written that he will uh, give his angels to charge over you and you will not strike a foot against your stone and jesus said to him it is also written you shall not tempt the lord your this balance in christian life is very much needed it is written it is also written never take one scripture and then build a doctrine out of it never don't take you know it's balancing in christian life is very very important and i was speaking to another pastor about a couple of days back and um, i have to tell him this because um, you know if you don't balance it then you are a candidate for to be deceived you know many people think willing to go and love the world they are willing to go and share the gospel to so many people they are willing to travel miles thousands of miles to go and share about god loves you come jesus is loving you jesus is calling you jesus is healing you jesus is setting you free but their life is a big mess they can't love their wife they can't love their children they can't have a good family life what is the point so your balance is to be first your life has to be a testimony your life has to show that you are a christian your family your children your life that's a testimony god is looking for god is not looking for a talented actors this this is very very important because if you lose this balance then what happens you may thinking that you are a very good christian but you may be deceived completely because when he quoted jesus quoted saying that you shall not tempt the lord your god and again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him the king all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and he said to him all these things i will give it to you if you will fall down and worship me then jesus said to him away with you satan for it is written you shall worship the lord your god with him only you shall serve him only you shall serve so how did he overcome he overcame because he knew what god has told him and not only that he knew the escape route the escape route is knowing the word of god and applying the word at the right time that is where you need the anointing of the holy spirit jesus was anointed with the holy spirit that is why he was able to overcome and everything with the help of the spirit the spirit of god will reveal the things how you need to live your life in the same thing in luke chapter 4 uh, this is the same part of uh, the uh, temptation uh, in a luke 4 after the temptation jesus goes into the synagogue and this is the first time he is going to preach and look for verse 18 you know when he goes to the uh, synagogue the attendant uh, gets up and he gives the scroll and he takes up the scroll and he takes the book of isaiah the scroll of isaiah and he goes through and then he comes to isaiah chapter 61 and then he reads this passage the spirit of the lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he has sent me to heal the broken hearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty of those 
liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the lord then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him and he began to say to them today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing so he took the scripture and he said the lord has anointed me to preach the good news and i am here to set the captives free and this is the year of jubilee and that is why i have come here and i am going to do this and this is what you know jesus reads just for a moment turn to isaiah 61 this is the quotation he reads from isaiah chapter 61 and you see purposefully he leaves one line from that verse as i 61 was 1 and 2 you see the spirit of the lord god is upon me because the lord that has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor he has sent me to heal the broken hearted to proclaim liberty to the captive and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the lord and the day of the vengeance of our god that praise he did not say in in verse 2 he said the first portion he did not say the second part of it to you know because the day of the vengeance of our god it's for another day that is when he comes for the second time that's when he is going to judge the people first time he has come he has come to set the people free why because he was anointed and through the holy spirit he is going to set the people free set those prisoners free because he has been anointed so that the holy spirit lives inside of you and me every one of us have been anointed by the same holy spirit so that holy spirit will help you and direct you how you can overcome every temptation Uh, apostle paul when he writes to corinth uh, church in corinth he explains this very well in first corinthians chapter 2 first corinthians chapter 2 verse 9 it says but as it is written i has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which god has prepared for those who love him but god has revealed them to us through his spirit what god has prepared what god has uh, kept ready for us in the old testament this is again from isaiah he is quoting from isaiah he says you know those days those people who living there they were crying out that we do not know what god has kept them for what god has kept and things like that they don't understand this is from isaiah 64 but then what he says is they did not know but for us god has revealed them to us through his spirit because i have seen when i am growing up and when i was in the initial stages as a christian this verse is always read in the funeral house you know because uh, we do not know like you know people have no clue so they stand there and then read it okay i has not seen nor has heard and that 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 okay but then the verse doesn't end there he says but god has revealed them to us through his spirit so it is our responsibility to have that anointing of god and receive the gift of holy spirit and receive the gifts of the spirit and understand what god has for us so that we will be able to walk through it we, you know in, in keep a finger here come to john 16 you know when jesus also talks about how the holy spirit comes in john 14 he talks about the holy spirit will come and he will live with for you uh, forever in verse 16 he says and i will pray to the father and he'll give you another helper and he will stay with you forever in john 16 uh, he talks about uh, the holy spirit and when he take uh, in verse 13 he says however when he that the spirit of the truth has come 
when he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority but whatever he hears he will whatever he hears you know the uh, he will guide you into all truth for he will speak on his own authority but whatever he hears he will speak and he will tell you things to come the holy spirit will teach you the things to come you know we know what has happened in our past right we know what has gone past in our past we all know what we did yesterday what we did last year we know and where we are we know what we don't know is what is going to happen the things to come who will teach us the holy spirit will teach us that's holy spirit taught jesus christ everything that's the anointing it's not for you to jump up and down or uh, speaking jumping and do speaking in tongues and all those uh, manifestation it is about living like christ that's the primary purpose in which you we all have been called we may not be able to uh, do whatever or we may be able to do more than what god has called you to do but all one thing what we all should do what we all should master in that is we have to become like christ because he is our forerunner he has run the race so how are to we are to live our life we have to live like christ so as we saw how he has overcome the temptation the biggest temptation of his life when he made satan on the wilderness how he overcame that's what we saw so you and me how we can live our life uh, turn to uh, hebrews chapter 12 you can read first corinthian 2 i told you to keep a finger there i know uh, you can read it later because first corinthian chapter 2 goes on to say that how the spirit of god searches all things and then how he reveals everything and finally that chapter ends with now we have the mind of christ that's how it ends because the spirit of god searches what is in god's spirit and then he reveals it to us so we become like christ in our mind uh so that uh, we have gone past the time so we will keep it so you can read it some other time we can do hebrews 12 verse 1 and 2 therefore we also since we are surrounded by so great so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us uh, because in hebrews chapter 11 uh, finishes and then 12 starts there it starts as therefore therefore means we need to look at what is earlier in hebrews chapter 11 talks about the heroes of faith both who have inherited the promises those have failed to inherit the earthly promises until verse 35 the until verse 35 middle it talks about those who have achieved something through faith in the middle of the verse 35 by faith those who have been killed those who have been persecuted those who have been sown into two those who have been thrown into fire everything he talks about it and then he says you have got this all this heroes of faith they are all waiting there we have got such a cloud of witnesses why they are waiting for us to finish our race it is like a relay race they have run their part and they are waiting for their gift they are waiting for their reward until we finish our race they cannot get their reward so they are all waiting for it so we got to run our race um, without you know uh, running a race you don't carry your bags you don't wear a suit and a formal things so the same way in any sin whatever which is ensnares which you can which cannot make you to run you get rid of all those things sin whatever sin you get rid of that and with the perseverance you run the race and then he says looking unto jesus so our eye should be fixed on jesus 
looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the same, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So what we are seeing is that Jesus ran ahead and he has completed his race and he is sitting at the right hand of God and he despised all the same and everything. What was the joy? That when he completes, he can have more children for God. More children of God can come and join to the, that joy he saw. He ran. You and me, why we should run our race? We see such a crowd, crowd of witnesses that all the heroes of faith who ran, they are all sitting. They are sitting there in the gallery. They are cheering up. Come on, Abraham, run. Come on, Isaac, run. Come on, Stefan, run. Like, you know, they are all clapping their hands. Come on, run, run, run. So you are running your race so that they all can get their reward. To get the reward, you need to complete your race. How you can run with the perseverance you can looking at Jesus, you can look at Jesus, how difficult it was, whatever the difficulty, whatever the trouble, in the midst of it, he chose to run the race, to finish the race, so that, you know, he can get the reward. So same way, we look at him, no shame, no thing, all the joy we see, when I complete, they all we get, every one of them are going to get, so we run our race, looking unto Jesus. So how you and me practically, how can we run our race? How can we live our life? That is only becoming like Christ. In every day of our activity, in everything, because the same Holy Spirit which has raised us to a new life, as Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. No longer I live, but Christ lives in me. So the old man is being crucified when you went down the water. When you came up, you become a new man by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the old man is dead. I think interestingly, yesterday in our uh, home group study, we were talking about forgiveness and uh, how we can overcome and uh, how it should be done. So I was sharing about how you can't hurt a dead man. You cannot hurt a dead man. Where have you seen anywhere dead man is getting angry? It's impossible. You abuse him, you tell him anything, you go and slap him, will he, will he slap you back or will he shout at you? No, you abuse him, he won't even say, it doesn't bother him. He'll be just lying down. That's it. Now, I was uh, talking to someone interestingly about a funeral cost, how it's been spiraled up in this country. You need to make a, um, you need to make a, some insurance. You need to pay some certain amount of pounds every month so that you know your funeral expenses can be met out. So interestingly, when we were sitting and talking about it in Japan, you know they can't even. Um, uh, put uh, people in a burial ground, you can't lay down, you have to standing only you can put up a person because the place is so small so they have to put uh, put the, bury the person standing and not only that they have to dig so deep so that there will be two or three people will be standing one above the other person, even in death you cannot be free, you can't even lie down, you have to be standing, somebody else will be standing on top of you like you know that's quite a, a bad scene like so, what I'm saying is, you know, <laughs> that's very funny, right? So, that's how it is. So, when we are dead, we wouldn't be reacting. We won't get angry. We won't get upset. We won't have any unforgiveness. We don't have any jealousy. We don't have any competition. I'm dead. I'm not living. Christ lives in me. I'm not living with myself. I'm, Christ lives in me. So if we have, if we can develop that attitude, then you will be able to live like Christ. You will be able to overcome every temptation. You will be able to overcome every trial. Then your life will be a wonderful life in the grace of God. So my dear brothers and sisters, I don't know how far you lived so, your life as 
how Christ lived. But we have been called to live like Jesus Christ. He is our forerunner. Maybe if you are one of the person who is thinking about uh, somebody who lived under the old covenant and you, he said, okay, come and admire me, then you are still in living in the old covenant. Or if someone comes and says, oh, you have to do this, you got to do this, even in our churches sometimes, uh, stupidly sometimes we do say, okay, you got to do this, you do this, you do this. No, it's not about doing it. It's about understanding and living it. That's what the new covenant life is. It's not we have, you have to put in a more bondage. Okay, it's like, you know, Christian life is so difficult. Oh, I can't do this. I can't do that. It's not like, you know, carrying a heavy burden. Oh my goodness, I can't breathe. Pastor, please help me. No, it's not that. It is about you don't live. Let Christ live through you. So that you can live a life which is peaceful and joyful and wonderful in the presence of God. As we all know, Matthew 11, 28. Come to me, all those are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. I will give you rest. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. So when you take up his yoke, when you take up his burden, you are going to live a peace and an easy and a joyful life in the presence of God. So I pray that you all will understand that Jesus lived like you and me and he has overcome every temptation and he can help us because he is sitting at the right hand of God and as 1 Corinthians 10, 13, the middle of the verse is how it says, God is faithful and he will help you so you will be able to have victory over every sin in your life and you will be an overcomer like how Christ lived. Let's pray.